Like I said, lots and lots happening today. We have someone coming up for you today who is an absolute inspiration. This man started a business with the investment of 37 pence. 37 pence. He borrowed his dad's ladder. And having read his book, I can honestly say that the success that this guy has, it's all about mindset, it's all about motivation, it's all about pure grit and knowing where you're heading and being the leader you need to be. You are going to have a fantastic hour with this guy. You get your pens ready. He's going to talk to you about how he was able to turn that business into a hundred million pound empire. 137p to a hundred million. It doesn't seem real, does it? But it is real. And here to tell you that story, let me welcome to the stage, Mr. Neville Wright. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Um, what a wonderful introduction. And uh, now I've got to live up to it. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I've got uh, 65 slides. It'll be broken into two parts. Uh, the first part will be mindset and motivation and uh, some keys that helped me uh, and hopefully help you through your journey in life. So um, the first part is uh, about my childhood um, because I think that's very important to know where you've come from and what happened and what motivates you. And uh, the, uh, then it goes on to starting the business with that 37 pence and why and how and um, and then going on to uh, uh, the uh, ups and downs in the second part ups and downs of business and uh, how to get through it and to uh, end up with uh, 100 million in 2011 uh, but um, not a lot of people know this since 2011 it's been 13 years and that 200 million doubled uh, that 100 million doubled so 30 uh, 61 years to get to 100 million and 13 years to get to the second 100 million so I just want to uh, emphasize that it, it's like a mushroom you know it grows and grows and grows and and um, is that a mushroom a mushroom cloud I think you know whatever um, so uh, so um, that's what I'm going to do so I hope you enjoy it and uh, and the first thing I've got to say is uh, there's a there's a warning because this presentation is for entertainment purposes only and uh, I don't class myself as, as, as an entertainer, but I want to be one. Uh, but I have always said, whatever you can, um, whatever you, your mind can conceive and believe, you can achieve. So if I can do it, anybody can. And that's where my lawyer stepped in. And he says, you shouldn't say that because Others may not be so uh, desperate as uh, I was to prove to myself that I wasn't the stupid child who stood in front of those uneducated teachers. And so my key for this is um, we are the only ones responsible for learning, no excuses. So whatever it is, um, we are the ones who are responsible. So um, that's the warning over and um, nobody can sue me now, can they, for saying it didn't work. So um, just going on to my... I'm, I'm reading a lot of this, I know it, because I go off on a tangent, that's the trouble, and my hour goes into three hours, and I know you don't want that. So I'm trying to keep, I'll keep myself on cue with... Um, uh, with, with reading some of this, else I'll go off on a tangent. So, um, the things people say will shape your life, 
but only if you let it. And a lot of people shape their lives through negativity. And, they, uh, and what I'm here to say is only let in the good stuff. So my um, mum and dad, they got married in the 30s and he was a carpenter, very good one. He'd just come out of his apprenticeship and uh, he was a super carpenter, cabinet maker and French polisher. And that's what he wanted in his life. He wanted a family, he wanted a house and he wanted to be, have a lovely, nice, easy, well I say easy, life. Um, and then, um, uh, very similar to today, but there was uh, a war on and it was a full on war. Uh, they called him up. Not like today, not like with Rishi, with his uh, uh, saying, kids will have conscription. It is for a reason. But the reason was, in those days, there was a war. And um, he was called up, and six weeks later, he went from being a carpenter to a killer. And then uh, to the Burmese jungle uh, for six years. And he came home, and I wasn't there, obviously, because I didn't get, uh, I, I wasn't about to in 1950, but apparently he, had a, he was a changed person, he was. And um, the one regret he has was, he just before the war, he had got a job in the electricity board in Peterborough, and they kept that job open for people who survived. And he went in, and he used to say, if he said to me, from the age of four to the age of 15, I should have, he said it a million times, I should have gone into business. I should, and he used to show me this shop opposite the football ground in Peterborough that was there. There was a furniture shop, and Mr. Dobson, who owned it, said, Arthur, will you come and uh, be my partner? And of course he was afraid. He was afraid. He'd, he'd had six years of every day didn't know whether he would survive, you know, uh, whether he would live or die, and yet this frightened him, and he was afraid to go into business. So, my key to this is never say you should have. I know it's very difficult that we all say it, but uh, try not to say I should have. So here I am, 1950, Give me a child until they're seven. Who's heard of that? Give me a child until... There was a, a program started in the 60s and every seven years they would uh, uh, follow their children right up to the age of 50 or 60 and um, give me a child until they're seven and I'll give you the man. And then nowadays the man or woman. And that's it. As far as... So you know where I am, there are two people. There's a man and there's a woman. There's nothing in between uh, that I want to know about because what aggravated... Now I'm going off track. What <laughs> aggravated me was when this swimmer, who was 462 in the world champion swimming, decided, he was a fellow, he decided to become a woman, then he went to number one. Just in one... And I blame the women for that because if I was there, uh, I wouldn't follow the protocol. I would have said to all the women, if I was a woman, I would have said to all the women, right, let him go. When that whistle blows, let him go. Let him do his up and down, his laps. Then we'll have the proper race. But they didn't, they complied. And there's too many people in this world who comply. And I'm here to say, don't. <laughs> so, um, the majority of children up to the age of seven are, are, are heading to success until they get into this uh, school, um, of, uh, this curriculum of um, sit still, shut up, do as you're told. Uh, and nowadays, I would be, they would be giving me pills or injections because I couldn't sit up, I couldn't sit still, I couldn't pay attention. So um, the key to this is learn from your children. Learn and answer their questions because it's really, really good for, for you. Now, 1955, my mum and dad sent me to an institution for 10 years 
and the day I went in there I knew there was something dreadfully wrong and um, I've got a label now uh, and I've got two labels a ADHD and dyslexia well they never had labels in those days you was uh, thick you was stupid um, and you needed a good belt in so in those days we didn't have those uh, those things you know um, I hadn't got a label and um, this is what I could see though letters moving about and that's what I see and I and I couldn't explain to the teacher I just said I can't see so they got they sent me to the doctor and give me glasses and all I could see then is bigger <laughs> but and it was the same and I couldn't I couldn't explain what was going on so they said I was unruly I was disruptive uh, because if you can't put those letters together to make a word and f remember it you can't do anything so they used to stand me in the corner with my face touching two walls while the other kids uh, got on with their work because they had got no understanding of what was going on and uh, so this led to um, uh, to, to big problems um, in my in my life and um, the hitting started because when you couldn't comply when you when you have a, a book and they say next 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 and uh, and you don't even know what page you're on let alone what sentence and if they did point to the sentence you wouldn't know what to say so when the beating starts and the and the teacher calls you stupid that's a green light for everybody else in the class to do the same so for 10 years it was hell and um, so uh, but when you when you think there's other people who've had the same problem and they've not done too bad the ones on here so uh, these labels that you get you can either use it for a crutch for all your life as negatives well I could have been I, I could have done all right but I couldn't spell you know I couldn't get a good job I couldn't do this I couldn't do that you know I've got to, you know, and it's like I've got ADHD so I couldn't concentrate I couldn't you know and this is and this is the labels put on people and the excuses why they haven't done well in life and they use it as a crutch but you can use it as a superpower as well so uh, this is just going on to children as well uh, every day I hear parents saying to their children I want doesn't get uh, has anybody said that or anybody <laughs> heard that and what do you think money grows on trees oh, yeah. Yeah, what do you think we're millionaires money uh, and, and uh, it's so wrong because you know 90 percent of parents answer the question with a no i was raised with uh, little disposable my parents had little disposable income so it was my questions were always answered with a no no stops creativity it demoralizes children and is an easy brainwashing tool for parents if only the misguided parents knew that a few positive words could make so much difference to their children and to their lives as well because if the children are successful it's they're going to help their parents if the parents wasn't educated so um, the key your child can be a genius if you help them and my ch I've got children, I've got grandchildren, and I've got great-grandchildren. And all of them can have anything they want. Not because I've got the money. It's because I say, whatever you want in life, right from when they can first start to talk, you can have, as long as you work for it. So therefore, they have the attitude, all of them, right from walk in they have the attitude that they've got to do something to get something so they can have everything in life they want but just not right now I like an ice cream you can have one you can have ten but not before your dinner you know and then in ten can I have ten yeah 
one a day or one a week you know it's not you don't just get it you've you've got to earn it so 1965 they freed me I was out but I was brainwashed because I've been told for 10 years every single day you never amount to anything boy or you'll never amount to anything right and it goes in and you believe what people tell the people who are teachers or supposed to be teachers are above you do you look up to them they've been put in that position because they must have done something you know good they must have been right so you believe them and I believed them but now in my life I was free but I was brainwashed so having been released from the institution feeling so happy and yet so lost at the same time but it would be down to me now to prove that I wasn't the stupid child that they portrayed me as yeah I had adhered to the teachers perception of me and I complied to their brainwashing techniques and of convincing me that I was stupid I left uh, this institution leaving with uh, well with zero with no grades whatsoever and um, I left early I left a few weeks early because I got a job and I knew they couldn't put me in jail I knew they couldn't come back and get me because it was only a few weeks left but I got a job but it took me so long to understand that a job wasn't for me so the key here is associate yourself with people that inspire you and that's easier said than done because in the 50s and 60s when you was brought up you was brought up not to speak to people you don't speak unless somebody speaks to you well who you know it, that I admire who's going to speak to me who I don't speak so who speaks to me nobody so I'd have to watch people try and listen to people who inspired me watch their movements watch how they walked and what they did and it's and but it's so hard nowadays kids are brought up with phones they're they're not beaten every day they're they're brought up to ask questions my wife couldn't answer a phone until she was 25 she dared not she'd been brought up in a Victorian family that says children should be seen but definitely not heard and a good slapping would put pay to that which she got every day until she was 15 until I met her then the bastard stopped yeah so um, he stopped hitting her then yeah so it was like that was that was one of the reasons um, that we were so tight knit together anyway having been released uh, have I read this bit yeah I was yeah I've um, I, I was happy and um, it's now down to me and I did adhere uh, to the teachers so yeah I've, I've done that I'm not I forget <laughs> yeah I'm 74 I forget <laughs> yeah. so the theme park where we all live we're all living in a park and we go we enter the park when we this is metaphorically speaking this is my interpretation of the world that goes on so I've developed this park mentality so we go into this park when we're born and we come out when we die would you go on this ride this is a super ride this is it's massive would you like to go on that ride would you if they paid you a million pound a month would you go on the ride every day <laughs> At a million pound a month people wouldn't go on it a lot of people wouldn't I'm hoping I'm talking to the people who would go on it for a million pound a month <laughs> so we get paid for every ride that we go on through life so 100% uh, of us go on the teacups for a start why not because we've just come out of school 
It's easy. But 90% of people stay on the teacups forever and they just go round and round doing the same old thing every day and they keep below the threshold of being having any arguments. You know, they, just, they just want an easy life and, a, uh, and, and everything to be all right. 90%. So that means 90% of people are not your competition. You can sell to them. 10% go on to the so-so tickets so they want a, a life with not so high, not so low, not so fast, not so slow. But they are so aggravated with themselves. They're the ones who get the mortgage and they get it paid off. They're the ones that get nice cars. They're the ones that get decent jobs. But they're frustrated because they want more. They see millionaires and they want what millionaires have got. But will they do it? I want to, but I can't. This is what their mantra is. I want to, but I can't. And say, why can't you? Well, I haven't got, the, nobody will give me the money. But you've got the money. You've got 600,000 wrapped up in your house. Yes, I have, yeah. Well, remortgage it. No, I'm not risking it. I'm not risking. And they go, I want to be self-employed. I want a business. But I don't want to risk. And, and I've got 15 years to go to get my pension. Get your pittance, you mean? No, a pension, because it's index linked. Yeah, what good's that? And this is what you get, and they're frustrated to hell, and they hate life, and, but 1% go on. And they go away from the crowd, and they get the ultimate ticket, <coughs> the ticket that experiences everything, and they become millionaires. So 1%. I'm glad I'm in the 1% and not the 9% below who was frustrated to hell. And I was on the teacups. So you really have nothing to lose joining the 1%. So opportunities. Yeah, so 15-year-old. What does a 15-year-old boy want? I don't know what 15-year-old boys want now, but when I was 15, there was only one thing I wanted, and that was to meet a girl. <laughs> and uh, so my goal was to find a girl. And it may seem simple, but this is the early mindset goal setting, and it's crucial. It's a crucial step for many people that, that many people overlook. By willing what you, what our minds see, we lay the foundations for the future success. And by the way, three girls turned up at my door six months later. So that's the power of uh, visualization. Yeah, so the key to that is open your eyes Turn what you see into opportunities. So visualize your hopes, your wants, your needs, your dreams, and they will appear. And it does work. It does. So in 1966, that year changed my life for the better. Two girls that I knew uh, rocked up at my door, at my mum's door, with this third girl, their friend, uh, and they'd brought her to have a look at me. But I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> they'd seen my picture in the paper because my... brother was a cyclist and he won a cup and I was standing there next to him with a few other people and they go I know that boy it was in the evening telegraph in the uh, in Peter Cathedral Square I know that boy and she obviously said something and they said we'll go and show you him so they, they came anyway we that was the 25th of June 1966 and we became inseparable and after six weeks of knowing each other we decided that we would spend our life together Together. and um, we had three goals and one was to get married one was to have a house and one was to have children and that was it usually at this point I say that was 58 years ago and I've never seen her since but <laughs> she's not here so it's not so funny yeah so <laughs> 
she's doing the washing because I come home from Montenegro last night so she's doing so she's doing the washing when see my daughter who lives in Montenegro and doesn't pay any tax that's why they live there <laughs> tax free yeah yeah I'm not bitter at all <laughs> most of my money <laughs> yeah no they have a good life they do it's, 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 and it was wonderful to see her yeah so the key is set your goals set them small and focus people have big goals you know they have so enormous goals that they're never going to get a chance to fulfill your enormous goals are for later your big goals your small goals are for the stuff that you want to build build your life on be flexible be willing to adapt and change go backwards in order to succeed uh, and the last slide said uh, I wanted to get a house so all, like all young couples you know, we were 16 coming on 17 we wanted a new house so we went and found a new house uh, there was a building in um, Farset near Peterborough and these new houses were £3,000 three bedroom chalet bungalow three thousand pound we wanted one of course we want so we went to the guy who does the mortgages and he looked at what we was earning and he says you don't stand a in chance you'll never get on the housing ladder you'll never get a house on what you're earning so i come out there bit uh, put out a bit depressed but and uh, and I go well that's fine if we're not going to get a new one we'll go to the other end of the ladder and we'll get the uh, we'll get the cheapest one we can possibly find so um, 18 months later I'd saved every penny that I had um, what I was earning and um, we lived with our parents anyway so that was it was very cheap way of living so um, that's it and we bought this house it was a thousand and um, 75 pound asking price and it had been empty for a few years no electricity no water no gas outside toilet no bathroom no kitchen nothing so it was a front and a back with the roof on and that was it so we got it for 650 pound and um, by that time this is this is the ADHD and the dyslexic but in that three years I'd worked on a chicken farm I'd been an apprentice plumber I'd worked on a pig farm I'd been a grease monkey which is a car mechanic uh, worked in a store then on to a bakery making cakes I went on to be a butcher then into a uh, onto a 13 hour night shift uh, operating a bread slicing machine uh, went um, and then on to a lorry engine plate uh, place uh, Perkins engines uh, that manufactured engines and um, then again moving on to a job erecting electricity pylons so that was my life every few weeks um, the key to this is if you have a glass filled with water or half a glass filled with water is it do you have half a glass is it full or is it half a glass is empty half full or empty that's what I'm trying to say <laughs> the choice is yours isn't it it's what you think so the second goal was achieved in 1970 4th of July it's coming up 4th of July isn't it that's uh, 54 years 54 years we'll have been married on the 4th of July I just hope I can scrape through the next three weeks and then without, uh, without aggravating her too much um, so the second goal was achieved we got married on the 4th of July and just one more goal to go and by that time as ever my world was changing continually afraid of showing just what I could do because I could I could organize people I got no issue in organizing people I knew what jobs to give them if it was raining what job to give them if it was dry you know who was good at this who was good at that but of course as soon as they promoted me I had to fill the diary in I had to do the job sheets and of course I couldn't and then they called me stupid and I run 
and, and in the 1960s and 70s, you could, if you ran, you could run from a job in the morning and get one in the afternoon. It was so easy. But that all come to an end in 1973. So, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd moved on anyway to a land reclamation uh, site, 2,000 acres. In fact, this building is built on one of the uh, knot holes that I helped fill in with fly ash. So all around here was a brick, brick companies. They dug the muck out and made bricks and then we filled them in with um, fly ash. So I was working on shift work there and I was helping my next door neighbour um, do decorating. So the key is work your ass off really every day. First baby born, 1971, Elaine, and that was the three goals. You know, that, uh, th that was our kind of life goals achieved. So um, that was April the 26th, 1971. We thought we had completed our goals, but how wrong could I be? The pitch was taken in the best part of the property. <laughs> uh, Elaine was four days old. Uh, we we're so really overwhelmed and pleased to be parents. And the key to this is you're only limited to your own mind. I, I could have painted that, couldn't I? But that was, well. So, with that in mind, if we'd got three goals and we'd achieve them, what was stopping us to get in 30 goals or 300 goals or 3,000 goals? I'll tell you what stops. It's fear. Fear of failure. That's, um, so we had got that terrace house and I was on shift work and every day somebody would wake me up a lorry driver would wake me up not the same one but a lorry driver would wake me up because there was an industrial unit at the end of the road and, and people couldn't get through I had to move my car so that was one of the things that uh, drove us to well we need a garage we need a and why not a semi-detached house instead of a terrace and why not have a front garden so we sold that house for 2100 and we bought the uh, semi-detached at Norfield Road uh, to, to 2000 and um, just decorated it and put a new plumbing in and etc and sold it in nine months time and um, because Marilyn said I'd like a place in the country and whatever Marilyn said I tried to get. So we got this place in the country, fine. I got a mortgage on it, £3,000 mortgage by then on that. And, um, and then I was working away 12 hours a day. Marilyn was uh, with the baby watching television 12 hours a day, Crown Court or Emmerdale Farm or whatever, driving her mad, you know, because there was nothing around, only fields and fields and fields, and when it was snowed, it was horrible, and she couldn't drive, drove her mad, and said, I want to get back in town near my mum and dad, or our mum and dad. So I bought this, I went to an auction with Langford Smith, and I bought this bungalow for 7,500, 26 Alexander Road. I didn't know that you have to pay for it once you've, once you've bid. I didn't know that. I, d I, d I don't know where it was. I don't know where the money was coming from. But Marilyn went the next day to Barclays. We hadn't even got a, an account in Barclays and it, because it was the nearest, uh, nearest bank to where my, father, where my father lived. And I dropped her off at uh, my dad's house and she walked down the road and said could I have seven and a half thousand explained what was going on and in those days the bank manager was the boss he made those decisions and she came out with seven and a half thousand which I thought was pretty good so now we've got two houses we've got one that I could do up and I took the windows out at the weekend I took the windows out hadn't got the money to put them back in. Then I took the chimney stack down because I was taking a wall down. Didn't know how to fill the hole up on the roof. Then I took the plumbing out, I took the electrics out and, and I devalued that house 
to 1,500 pounds. <laughs> and, and, and I couldn't afford to skip, so all the rubbish was piled up, and I think I devalued the next door neighbor's houses as well. You know, so I thought I was a builder, but I wasn't. And then I got this letter from Barclays saying, your bridging loan is about to expire, and if you don't pay, bridging, what was a bridging loan? I thought they'd give us the money, but the bridging loan was expiring, and, um, and if we don't pay, then we'd have to give them both of the houses to auction off. By the skin of our teeth, the bungalow sold, but then we'd got nowhere to live because I'd wrecked this house. So we bought a 10 foot caravan and we lived in the back garden. Uh, be, uh, and that was it. And I was still working 12 hours a day. And, um, and Marilyn, uh, and it was snowing because 73, 74, it was, the winter was uh, bad. And, um, and so we got a little three year old, wanted to go in a building site playing, no washing machine. So I went out to work for 12 hours a day and Marilyn cried for 12 hours a day. And I thought, what a shit I am. What, I've, what have I done? What have I got ourselves into again? And um, I, said, I said to her, look, there's only one way up from the bottom and we're, we're at the bottom. So, you know, think positive. <laughs> Now, I hated my job, and by that time I was working for the Ministry of Defence waiting for war. And it was the most boring job that I've ever had in my life. And I hated it. And if you put something into your mind, you will get it. And I didn't want that job, but I wanted the money. And a recession came along, and I got fired. And uh, so you think you're at the rock bottom, but then you really are. Um, and I felt like scum having to, scum of the earth having to uh, line up in the dole office because I hadn't got any money. So my mindset was just follow the crowd and the government will look after us. I know different now. So uh, we all at some time in our lives think that the government will look after us but the penny drops and you realize what a load of rubbish that is. And, uh, and knowing if you carry on doing the same thing tomorrow as you've done today, you're gonna to get the same results. So I wanted something different and um, I'd gotta change my inner thoughts. But it was a, an awful job to, to do that. So I was getting frustrated and um, a new determination in my mind uh, was what I needed and uh, I needed a lifestyle change and the key is to that is all it takes is to be success successful to be 1% better than your nearest rival and that's all it is and that's what we found when we had the shops there was 12 shops in Peterborough that did the same thing as us we only had to be 1% better to knock them off the, uh, off the list. So after 18 jobs, uh, ending up on the dole, and that inspired me to change my stinking thinking, because that's what it was. The world wasn't fair. Why shouldn't I have as much money as everybody else? Why, why me? Why is it always happening to me? And I expected more, um, but I wasn't going to get it, was I? Because I had the wrong mindset. So we decided that after 18 jobs, we really wanted to work together. We always wanted to work together, uh, but now was the opportunity to do that. But what could we do? So we went through the A to Z, because there's no internet in those days, went through the A to Z, the yellow pages, you know, the telephone directory, whatever it was, and we looked at every single thing what was in there. And there was nothing that we could do. And the reason was two reasons. One, I had no skills. Even though I'd had 18 jobs, very fleeting 18 jobs, I didn't think I'd learn anything. And I thought you had to have a certificate. 
So you, if you want to go around somebody's house and mend their fence, I thought you had to produce a certificate for it, you know, to say I'm competent in mending fences. But, you know, that's, that's what I thought. And the other thing was, I couldn't copy anybody else because you needed money, and I hadn't got any. And there was no money, nothing. So you, you didn't want to get up in the morning because you're so depressed, and then you thought if you do get up, if you could sleep a bit longer, that's, you'd need less food because we hadn't got any food. So it was like, keep, keep your eyes closed because then you don't eat. And we were so depressed and it was horrible. And I was saying, queuing up, I, it was like scum of the earth, it was. And um, I remember the first time I went to the Dole office in Queensgate, it was Queensgate then, before Queensgate was built. Um, I hid round the corner on my bicycle and I counted 20 people going in and 20 people coming out. And I thought, there's nobody in there. And I rushed through the first set of doors, rushed through the second set of doors, and there were two lines of people. As long as this room lined up, I hadn't took notice of what people were wearing. All I did was count the people. And everybody was like this. And nobody wanted to look at anybody because they might recognise somebody who's on the dole and, uh, and everybody thought they'd got a job. It was, and I prayed to my God Please give me another chance. Please give me a, a job and I'll be the best employee ever. Uh, of course, my God obviously said to himself, it's time he stood on his own two feet because um, he didn't answer me at all. Yeah. So um, one day I heard a commotion outside our house. Uh, we got nothing else to do, so we went and uh, look. And there was this lorry, and it was unlo and it got a crane, and it was unloading big windows and big sheets of glass because across the road there was a chiropractor who was making a, a new um, chiropractory place, you know, a new extension. Um, and I said to Marilyn, "Look, some I think I said some twat uh, has got to clean that glass." Um, and then I thought, "I know one." <laughs> I've known one for 24 years. How difficult can it be? A bit of rag, a bucket of water, and maybe a ladder. And then I realised that every house, every building has got windows. It was just staring me in the face. And what would it take to buy a piece of cloth to, you know, wash windows? So next day was the Thursday, and I went, uh, I went to the Dole office and. Um, I said, I've got this great idea. Oh, they ask you a question. Have you done any paid work for the last seven days? And I would always think, if, if I'd done, if I'd got a job, I, I wouldn't be in this fucking place, would I? You know, it'd be like, but I didn't say anything because you don't want to draw attention to yourself because somebody might go, oh, Neville, I know you. You know, anyway. Um, yeah, so, so I said, I've got this great idea. I want to be a window cleaner but I haven't got any money, so what I want to do is every Thursday come and tell you how much I've earned, and then just make it up, and then eventually, if it's a success, I won't have to come here again. They go, no, you're either on the dole or off the dole. And I said, well, I've got to stop on the dole because I've got no money, and I'm afraid that it, that it won't work. My idea won't work. And then I'm really in, because you have to wait another six weeks before you get any dole. So, I said, but if I'm stopping, I really need two pounds extra a week because I can't afford to eat. And, um, and they said, right, let me have a look. And they got the folder out and they said, I've got your one child. I said, yeah, I can't afford to feed it. You know, my mother and my, uh, and my uh, 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 wife's aunt was feeding us. And, um, and they said, oh yeah, if you want two pounds, have another baby. <laughs> and that's... And I go, you are joking. I was furious and I was sad at the same time. And they said, that's it. If you have another baby, you get another two pound. But you've got to have that baby first. I said, I can't afford the... Feed the... Yeah. I said, look, you can't look after me. My employers couldn't look after me. Well, they could, but it was me that kept running. Um, I said, I'll look after myself. Because I was defiant. I was 20... 
four years old, you know, I was hot-headed. I thought, you can stick it. You know, so they said, are you signing yourself off? I said, yes. I knew they wouldn't let me sign off because in those days the unions controlled England and without me being on the dole, those people behind their counter wouldn't have a job, would they? That's what I thought. But he let me sign it and he took it back and I looked at him and he said, can I help you? I said, yeah, what do we do now? He says, you can do what you like. You don't have to come here anymore. Next. And that was it. He didn't give me the two pound. So I went out saying, sod them, got on my bicycle, <coughs> cried on the way home because what had I done? I'd let Marilyn down once more. What am I going to tell her? I'm now up again and not even got the dole money for this week. So I got me, I, I, I was drying my eyes and I swore to myself that this is it, it's time to burn my bridges. And when I went in, Marilyn said, how did you get on? I said, great, we can now do whatever we want in life. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, that, uh, that was something. Now, this alarm clock thing that I've got on here is because for, for all those years, from 1965 to 1973, that alarm clock told me when to get up to go to a place that I didn't want to go to, and it ru ruled my life. So um, I threw that alarm clock away because I, I, I wasn't gonna have one anymore because um, if the alarm clock had gone off, I wouldn't be there because I'd got a new enthusiasm. I would be up before that alarm clock ever went off and I'd be working. So my work ethic changed that day, it did. I went from a lazy little bastard to really a workaholic, <laughs> I did. So, um, yeah, so all I'm gonna do is ask, uh, I changed my alarm clock for a, real, for a real life, but if you've got an alarm clock, um, and you're waiting for the alarm clock to wake you up, uh, to inspire you to get out of bed. Why? Why do you have an alarm clock? I don't want you to answer, but I just want you to put that in your head. Yeah, so, um, so there I was on that Thursday, 10.30. I was um, on the 26th of September. I was a beggar, begging for money with no plan B, begging for two pound. By 12 o'clock, I was chairman of the board. <laughs> I, I had that altercation. I was chairman of the board, I was. Yeah. <laughs> and, and by five o'clock, I made my first acquisition, which was a piece of scrim from Pridmore's in, on Lincoln Road, which was 37 pence. A piece of scrim is a cloth for cleaning windows. And I went to my dad's house and I said to him, can I, can I borrow your ladder? And of course he said, yes, he did. Uh, yes, yeah. so um, that's, uh, and, I, and I swore to myself, I would never ever go cap in hand to anyone ever again begging for money and I would pay a million pound in tax every year as soon as I could and um, I, I must say the most of uh, it took about 20 years before I paid a million pound in tax and the most I've ever paid is nearly 12 million pound and um, and I thought I wanted to pay the million pound because they couldn't give me the two pound and I thought they was hard up. I, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is what I thought. Yeah, I thought the government was hard up this. Anyway, so, um, yeah, and, and what stopped me from going back into that dole office, because the first couple of years was really terrible. I, I was earning less than what I was on the dole, you know, and um, I was working 16 hours a day. It was just like, it was crazy. And I felt so low so many times, you know. I, I, I would be up a ladder and I would be freezing, I'd be shaking, I couldn't hold my tools. Or like when I was putting a gutter up, I couldn't hold my tools because my, it, it was, and I'd be, sh my legs 
legs would be shaking and I'd be crying on that ladder because I was so exhausted. And, um, but what kept me going was the thought of opening the dole office door and that boy at the end saying, come on in Neville, you fucking loser. I knew you would come back. And that's what drove me every single day, thinking of that conversation I'd have to ask, you know, how begging for money again. So um, that was, uh, yeah, so the key here is burn your bridges and just fight and never give up. So after uh, starting the window cleaning business, uh, we got a few pounds, we started renovating the house and, we, and as we was getting a few more pounds, Marilyn could put the baby into a home and, um, and uh, don't look at me like that, it's a, it's a home, you know, where you put a babies in for the day. Nursery. nursery that's it yes yes we didn't put the baby into a home we put it into a nursery yeah for a few hours and uh, so we doubled the profit because Marilyn came and helped two and two heads are better than one and um, and so it went on and Marilyn used to, uh, as we grew the business Marilyn used to drive the truck I wasn't going to let a fella drive the truck because uh, they could be digging holes or mending roofs or doing whatever but if I sent a guy to to get some bricks he'd screw up he'd have to load his own lorry he'd have to I send Marilyn 24 year old girl in a truck she wants some bricks oh my god come to the front of the queue we'll load them for you and so and so therefore she was quicker than any fellow would be in the builders merchant time and motion and that's what I was learning time and motion yeah just so uh, a goal within a goal so we, uh, we realised that, that window cleaning has got a ceiling. Your 20, windows, uh, 20 houses a day, five or six days a week, there'd be a ceiling and you could work it out quite easy. If the weather was all right, you'd know the maximum you would get. And everything else, if the weather wasn't, you wouldn't get it. So that's like having a job. I didn't want a job anymore. By now, I wanted to be rich. I was fed up with being so poor and having nothing. I wanted, in the future, I wanted to be rich. So therefore, window cleaning wasn't on the agenda. So gradually that moved because people used to, my book called The Answer Is Yes, Now What Is The Question, was from about three or four weeks into uh, cleaning windows, a, a woman uh, looked up the ladder and said, Never, while you're here, I said, yes, I will. She said, I have not asked a question yet. I said, I will do anything at all that you want me to do, as long as it's not immoral or illegal, because in my mother's eyes, not in my eyes, but in my mother's eyes. In my mother's eyes. Because my mother used to say, if you do anything wrong, boy, Lord Jesus will punish you. And if he's not around, I will. <laughs> And she had this cane and she used to beat me with this cane and and i tell you what i got i could, i was pretty athletic when i was a kid i used to get on the fence up the drain pipe onto the uh, pull myself over the gutter onto the roof and i used to be there and i used to hide next to the chimney she used to say get down here boy you wait till your father gets home he will get it i say he won't get up here <laughs> yeah very often it'd be dark by the time again and then they felt so sorry for me so they used to feed me so that's all right yeah so um, I've got that I've just gone off on a tangent there just thinking about it so right way decorating and property maintenance yeah so we did that and every day we would um, well Marilyn would work and then look after the baby when they come out of the home and um, and I would work 16 hours a day and that was just normal it was so uh, the key here is to involve other people to help you move towards your goalpost. You need people. And uh, I couldn't have done it on my own. There was no way I could have done it on my own. I couldn't even read and write, let alone, you know, what could I do, you know? But I, I could organise and I could, and I worked like a Trojan. So uh, set yourself clear goals. Define what success looks like to you, your family and your business. So, like at the bottom of this chart, it was when I was employed. I don't want to do it. 
or the excuse is I can't do it you know um, but when you start to go self self-employed I want to do it how do I do it you know you learn you educate yourself I'll try to do it I can do it and I will do it and it's all that it was a transition from going from working uh, saying life's not fair to understanding that I'm the only person responsible for myself and everything everybody around me so uh, that was a transition and it was a hard transition uh, in ways to make because I wasn't educated but it was an easy transition on the other hand knowing that I was I was going to get somewhere <coughs> have the future in mind so I had limiting beliefs um, I used to see others as better than myself all the time and um, uh, imposter syndrome and I felt unworthy but it was all those things that you really really have to get over you know and I used to talk to myself every day repeat 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 good things to yourself yeah so um, do you have goals and then uh, 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 acquire the necessary knowledge to guide you to success yeah so the key is set goals every hour of every day I used to do minutes I used to get into minutes mind mindfulness be present be focused um, uh, on multiple streams of income why do you just want one stream of income I want income when I'm sleeping that's what I want that's what I thought I read the book uh, the lazy man's way to riches because I was painting somebody's house and there was this lazy git who would just sleep on the settee all day he was a young guy and I asked him to open the window and on the windowsill he'd got this book by Joe Carbo um, the lazy man's way to riches and I thought I want some of that I want to be that because I'd like to be lazy and rich and um, anyway it wasn't it was it was uh, reverse psychology you know you thought if you read that you could be lazy and rich but it wasn't it was the reverse it, you know it was telling you get off your ass and do something and then so um, I read that book or I half read it and uh, I think I've still got it and still I filled all the things in wants and needs and hopes and dreams because it was one of those books that you could write in as well yeah so uh, he may have been on shift work he may have been the hardest worker out but I just looked at him and I thought it's lazy this is the perception you get up here so January January 1977 um, we'd been working together since 74 um, we'd got six people working on the building uh, in the maintenance business then and Marilyn's goal was to stop working every day on the building sites, mixing sand and cement and decorating. And she wanted to stop that. And she just wanted to do the book work where she used to do the book work at nights and do hairdressing. And at nights when I wasn't working on the, uh, for, in somebody's house, I would be working for a company called um, uh, Buy and Sell Direct. Uh, it was a, a state agent and never paid me. Marilyn used to sell flog uh, um, turf over the phone. Uh, she did that for six months and all the checks bounced. You know, it's like, it was, it, it was hell it was. So anyway, she wanted to have the evenings free with the baby now that was growing up. And, um, and so she said, look, I want to do the book work in the daytime. We bought a terraced house down Borge Boulevard, 3,000 pound. And, um, was going to renovate it into a, uh, an office and loads of houses down there was being made into offices and shops and Marilyn said we could sell something because I won't want to do book work all day you know it take a couple of hours so we'll sell something we nev never knew nothing about retail and we kept thinking what can we buy we've got 300 pounds to spare what can we buy we didn't know and then we reverse psychology uh, we looked at it reverse and said what have we bought what have we got something big and cheap to fill the three rooms that we've got big and cheap what have we bought we bought a cot we bought a pram we bought a high chair that's what we'll do we'll do second hand nursery equipment so we went out in the van every night with the newspaper with all these people local who's selling their old prams 
and they would say oh you can have those toys as well because of course they all thought she was pregnant and it was like embarrassing when get out oh I have these clothes as well is it going to be a boy or a girl and you think, oh no it's going to be a shop <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, so, oh, at that time my mum and dad had a, a pipe burst in their house, so they lived with us, So, which was a good thing because my mum could look after our little girl while we went out buying these prams, and my dad, when I brought them home, he could clean them, ready to put in the shop. Yeah, it's again, time and motion. So, um, where was I? I've gone off track again. Yes, yeah, so anyway, the key is to focus on what you're doing, but keeping an open mind for n on new horizons. Keep looking. Well, we had that shop for 77 to 80, and it was really, really going well. We needed a bigger shop. It was like a Black Friday every day. People, there, there wasn't enough room in the shop to get the queue into there. And um, I'd put a domestic staircase, I'd turn the staircase around, put a new domestic staircase, so we've got one room at the bottom, one room at the top. And there are only four inch brick walls these places are. And one Saturday, there was one person on the step uh, of the 13 rungs going up, and one person, there was like 26 people on a domestic staircase, and I thought, shit, this is going to break, this is. And these two fluorescent lights, this, the, the, the uh, bedrooms, which were now one uh, room, what sold cots uh, in, it was Boeing. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, the light was about to pop out the socket, and I was really scared. So I decided we'd sell that, we'd move. So. Uh, we found this place in the Orton Centre, a new shop, five times the size, and, um, and, and we, we didn't just move, we sold the business as a going concern. So we had uh, two lots of people who wanted it, and uh, they bid for it, basically, and, um, and I'd already sold the bricks and mortar to an investor. So that £3,000, we ended up making uh, £18,000 on that. So this shop we developed um, is five times the size and in two years we had 15 staff. We was only used to having one part-time staff, staff in, the, uh, in the other shop. So things were going quite well. Um, the key is never be afraid of employing people to grow your business and we've employed thousands of people. So uh, 1982 expansion in all fronts the shop the property and um, and the family when Joanne arrived and I was still got the building business we were still renovating properties and um, we were doing all right we were so 11th of November Joe came along Marilyn had to take uh, herself to the uh, hospital because I was filming her and um, and then it was on a Wednesday, she booked in on Wednesday because the rules were, because you have to have rules when you have a business, and the rules were nobody has more than three Saturdays off a year. Well, she'd had three Saturdays off and, and, and she'd got to get back to the shop on the Saturday to serve. So she made the rules, so she had to abide by them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, and a rep came in the next week, said, I thought you was having a baby. She said, I've had one. I said, well, where is it? She said, it's under the, under the desk with the dog in a carry cot. <laughs> so we'd converted a toilet in this building and we took the door off and we put the door across making a bench and three stools and three people worked on there and the dog and the baby was underneath. Yeah, so that's how it was. So um, anyway, carry on. Ah, Marilyn said bring me some food because this place hasn't got any food the um, maternity so I was now 32 years old I'd never cooked my mum cooked obviously and then Marilyn cooked but I never cooked bring me some food so I thought cooking 
was uh, half a pint of milk an angel delight packet and she looked at me in disdain and said oh, I said food so that was an opportunity because I ate it and I also I, t <laughs> I, I also took her a briefcase with 30 invoices in so um, she had to make the checks out and I licked the envelopes and licked the bowl as well so there was a win-win it was so yeah so the key is take it take it in your stride and create determination determination to never give up so now we yeah we've focused and worked our ass off um, and ignore negatives so the business was taking off rapidly and we was buying renovating and selling both residential and commercial property by now uh, and we wanted to have oh and we bought um, brand new houses from Gelson that we was renting out to uh, people in the uh, American Air Force and they didn't pay the rent in those those days you could get away with it um, so um, not until they left and then they had to pay when they left so there was messing us about I wasn't a very good debt collector and um, and people was living in better houses than we were so we found this house it was about 8,000 square foot, a beautiful house. It was the most expensive house in Stamford in Lincolnshire. And um, it had two acres of uh, ground, an indoor swimming pool, but the rest of it was first fix. And, um, and I thought, well, we, you know, it'd be, be nice. We'd already bought a house and I was building a swimming pool in there. And I'd just gone to have a look at this house to see what ceiling the swimming pool had got. So I didn't make a mistake with, you know, with the condensation. Anyway, we fell in love with the house. And, um, and we ended up selling all the other houses that we'd got that we'd accumulated over the last few years and buying this. And when people saw what we'd, what we'd got from living in the caravan eight years before and window cleaning, they said, they said, you couldn't do it legally. There was something wrong. But this is how people think. And they think it's, it's impossible. And what they are thinking, they're thinking of themselves, what they do, how they would do things. And, and I usually listen to Zig Ziglar, and Zig Ziglar said um, on one of his uh, tapes, if you want the purest, cleanest water, you've got to find the deepest well. And if the pump doesn't work, you have to prime the pump. So that means you've got to get a bucket of water from somewhere and somebody's got to tip it in and somebody's got to pump like mad. And if they don't keep pumping that pump, the water will just go down and you have to start all over again. And it's like, and if that, if that water's 50 meters away, what do you do? Bloody run. So metaphorically speaking, when these people have gone home after eight hours work we're still working they don't see that they think we're the same as them so I was pumping that bloody pump and Marilyn was running with those buckets every single minute of the day and when they go to bed and they think everybody else goes to bed but we was pumping that pump and running with the buckets and when they went on holiday we was doing exactly the same probably I was running with the buckets and Marilyn was pumping the pump but it was the same so eventually these things accumulate and accumulate and if you're doing if you're doing twice as much as anybody else a normal person and if you're doing it quicker you're going to earn more money and if there's two people doing it two heads are better than one and you can do the same amount as four people can do and if you're working twice as hard it's equivalent to eight wages and you go they don't understand you know, so when people say you it's impossible to get that I'm here to say no it's not it's just how we did it was it was just incredible so uh, was there a was there something on there was there a key yeah the key is figure out a way to get what you want and if it's to work harder and if it's to do more then I used to uh, look at uh, a window and assess how long will it take to paint a window. Okay, so you've got to rub it down, you've got to prime it, you've got to do this, you've got to do one, two coats, whatever it is, three coats. Um, I used to make that assumption of what a normal painter would do if there was working for some like Prince Build or, or Travis or wherever. I would work on that assumption. 
and then I would give them a price, which is always a bit cheaper than uh, a main contractor. And then I would work twice as quick. I wouldn't stop for a tea break. I would be I would be up in the morning earlier than them. I would be later than them. So I could do more windows in a day than a normal painter. I could probably do twice as many. So therefore I was going to get twice as much. And time. You know, you've got an extra day. You yeah. have. So when do you start the kids earning money? I started mine at, at 10. So um, they, they, if you could show the kids how to read accounts and then they know what the business is earning and what you can get, the lifestyle you can get, because we, um, we had about 12, 15 years of not even eating in our house because we'd go from work to a restaurant and that um, because we would meet reps because we hadn't got time in the day to make our orders so the reps would come to the restaurant with us and then the reps would come home and live in our house instead of a uh, hotel so it was a win-win situation for all of us um, but the kids used to come with us so they were used to um, a better lifestyle which was being paid by the company. So in 1983, the average wage for a shopper assistant was between six grand and seven and a half. We was making 60 grand. But we wasn't spending 60 grand, we'd still be spending like equivalent to seven and a half thousand. The rest of it was going into the business. And this is what we taught the kids. And they got paid for every hour they worked. And both of them left school at 13, and both of them come into the business and um, being, being self-taught. Self yes, yeah, so um, one was bullied and um, we wouldn't have her here now if we'd have left her in school and one just said, well, I'm, I'm not going to school anymore because uh, there are just a load of kids there, you know, because they, they was used to being with adults and working, you know, and earning money. So working with our children has been the greatest thing that could have ever happened to us. So the key is, delayed gratification is uh, a great lesson. Now, um, we embrace unexpected opportunities because one day we wanted a, a 5,000 square foot building just to house some stock for the shop. So this was, building was advertised, it was a co-op supermarket, but it didn't advertise as a co-op supermarket. We thought it was like a shed, a farmer's shed in a village. We got up to it and we said to the agent, why didn't you advertise it? Because they said they don't want the staff to know and they don't want uh, the locals to know until it's sold and shut down. So that was 100,000, I bought it there and then. Two years later, I sold the lease on that on the, sh the other shop that I'd got for £100,000. So the lease paid for that, it did. Um, but we got no intention of expanding. We was going to be in that shop for 25 years and then we'd still got the idea of retiring. And all of a sudden, with a one second, our lives changed. We was going to have this, we was going to expand. So, um, the key is fulfill your hopes, wants, needs and dreams. Why not fulfill them? That was great. And everybody said uh, you'll never make a living in a village in a 5,000 square foot shop selling baby stuff and children's stuff. Uh, you want to bet? There was, there, was, there was a school opposite. You know, it's like there's loads of parents about. You know, it's, People, you can look at opportunities in different ways. So in 1985, uh, we're talking about fear or fearless. We'd got, I'd got a lead by example. By then, we'd stopped. We was doing building, but we're subcontracting the building. We're building the houses and factories, but we were subcontracting them. I wasn't getting into uh, to that then uh, because I was more interested in the shop. I loved the shop. So lead by example. We was uh, employing, I think, about 35 staff by then uh, in two uh, buildings and. Um, 
demonstrate the mindset and the behaviours that you want in your team. And that's when we started putting systems in place because when you get a lot of people, well it's about probably 30, um, you need systems, you need to make it work so when you're not there, it's still working. And we didn't want to be there all the time. You know, we, got, we was getting enough money that we could go on holiday every month, you know, and things like that. So uh, we had to put systems in and that was uh, uh, great and it continued on right, right until now. So fear, the driving force behind ch life changing. So fear of failing, I mean I would, mo I would say most people have had these fears. Fear of failing, fear of looking stupid when speaking in front of people. Who put that in there? <laughs> uh, fear of death or fear of success. There are two fears. A lot of people are fearful of success. And I'm not fear, I don't fear death. So uh, I'll come along to that bit later, probably in the second bit. So the key is stand still, do a risk assessments and ask yourself if you really believe them. So, what are the risk assessments? If you're confronted with fear, do a risk assessment based on logic, common sense, history, and I would uh, be a bit careful with this science, don't take too much notice of science, but take notice of your heart. So do a risk assessment and ask yourself if you really believe those. Okay. 83 to 95, our feet didn't touch the ground and that was, that was incredible. We were looking at properties every day. We'd got the, we'd got the uh, uh, shop was booming, it was, and, uh, but we were free. We were free to go out at any minute of the day and look at property, which we did every single day, and we'd be buying property. Small places like the Crown Fish Bar and mm, oh, hairdressers, Euroclean, Canton City, which is a takeaway, um, lots of oh, estate agents, lots of different small shops. So um, we, we went looking every day. We remortgaged the bigger things like our house, so we can have cash. So you can go up to a state agent and say, I've got the cash, Here is, here's the proof that we've got the cash in the bank. Um, and then when we've got a lot of small places, we could put that into the bank and have a bank overdraft. So it's always, if you've got the cash, cash is king and people will take notice of you. The other thing is know your market. The key is know your market better than anyone in your area of business. So you should know, if you're in Peterborough and you do houses for instance, or shops or offices, you should know every single one of what, what there is in your, in your business. Everything was for sale, every price, every estate agent who um, deals with that. You should know them personally, you should know what's going on. And that minute that something comes on, or before it comes on, you'll get a phone call because you can make the decision. You know, and they know that you will go through with it. And once you do that, people will say to me, "Oh, if I could get the deal that you get, then I'd go into business." No, you bloody wouldn't, because you've got to be in it to win it. Nobody, uh, nobody is going to ring you and say, "I've got a really good deal for you." One, if you've never done anything with them before and they don't know you, yet they've got their little black book of names and addresses. Who's got the money? Who will, who will say yes or no? And who will complete in a month? So, people will go. When I get the deal, then I'll, then I'll go into, in, into business. Doesn't work. 1996, oh, they were, they were the times when you could just buy that Porsche, the 911 Turbo, a 72,000 pound that was, you know, and it was just like that. Rolls Royces, Bentleys, two Bentleys. Why do I want two Bentleys? It's stupid, <laughs> you know, it's absolutely stupid. And it's like, and you do these things to get you out, motivate you to get you out of bed because you become complacent when the money's rolling in and you, and you tend to become complacent.
investment and you have too many holidays and, and you get into trouble. And um, so, so this is why people go, why are you not retired? Because I don't want to get in trouble. You know, and it's as simple as that. Um, uh, because ADHD and stuff like that will get you into trouble, no problem. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was work I, I, I've been working like a madman. And now as you know, you think it's time for rewards, but you just got to be careful. Um, you know, there's a way of going on that can get you into trouble. So keep it real. Remember where you come from and how much you do you want to change as a person. And, oh, look at that. Just don't become an ass, because I've been one, and I regret it, you know. You, you just, there's nobody, you're not better than anybody else. And, uh, but it was only for a short time, and then I realized, yeah, so, back to work. Yeah, so think, 1999, think five years ahead. I was always thinking five years ahead. What's the market going to be like in five? What's the market going to be like in industrial property, in residential property, in buy-to-let, whatever it may be? What's it going to be like in, in retail? How is it going to go? And I said, in five years' time, people will be buying off the internet. And everybody goes, you're fucking mad. You're mad. Nobody. You'll sell a, you'll sell a CD or a book, but a pram... That is like, no way. I didn't believe them. I just thought there was naysayers, you know, and that was it. I didn't, so we were gonna sell prams. We were gonna sell prams online. And um, so I've got a son-in-law who used to work at Cotton's. Does any, I don't know whether anybody knows Peter at all, but there was Cotton's rentals, TVs. And when he left school, he, was going, he worked at Cotton's. Then he worked, somebody else or and then he worked in his own business and and then he worked in London for himself and he was doing computers yeah from computers from this building to that building and things like that in Hoburn anyway we said you know about computers you can make us a website so this went on for about 18 months he was going to but he's always too busy and uh, he needed more people because he knew what to do the the uh, Marilyn and I and the two girls knew what we wanted to put on it and how it wanted to look. He hadn't got the time to to do it, but he knew how to connect it all up and how to do the pay thing and advertising. So this uh, this lad came along. Um, he were, I, I wanted somebody to rip up cardboard and put it in a skip because I was unloading 40-foot lorries every minute of the day. I loved it, but I hadn't got time to, I used to get all the stuff out, give it to the girls and boys in the uh, uh, shop, and then I was left with all this cardboard. I hadn't got time to fold it up. So we employed this lad who came, and, and uh, I used to get rid of all the baskets from the girls' office and you know, every night at four o'clock, and I was in there, I used to go in the office at four o'clock to see what happened in the day, see what we was doing, see what... And, and Barry came in and he got the baskets and he got the waste paper baskets and one of the girls said, oh, my computer's gone wrong again. So he looked at it and he goes, whatever, or, or maybe he did it that way. Um, but it's like, it was like, and everybody goes, everybody's silent in the office because we didn't know about computers in 1997. You know, they were there, w why were there? I don't know why they were there. But um, the girls were doing things and they go, Barry, how did you do that? And he goes, oh, it's my hobby. Two weeks, and I said, put the baskets down, Barry. <laughs> put them down. <laughs> I said, you're now our IT manager. <laughs> That's the way we did things in those days. You know, the, the, the guy, uh, another Barry, who caught a thief. I said, how did you do that? He said, oh, I worked on Tottenham Court Road. We used to catch thieves every day. I said, what are you doing in the warehouse? He said, the only job you'd give me, or any job I could get. I said, you're now our security manager. <laughs> and that's how it worked. That's how it worked. Anyway. Three weeks later, Barry was at his desk now. Not, I had to find somebody to rip cardboard up then. Yeah. Uh, and Barry was at his desk and I said, I said, Barry, my dream is to have a website. 
that we can sell these prams. Do you know anything about it? And he goes, oh yeah, I, I've got one. I made one myself. And I go, Christmas is here again. <laughs> it's like fantastic. So with, with us knowing what to put on, because we was working on the shop floor, Barry could do the website and Scott, he knew how to do all the technical stuff, uh, like to connect all the other bits of what we needed and for the advertising and everything else. And that was 1998 Barry came to us, what's that, 26 years ago. And Barry is still with me today. In fact, Barry's sitting at the back there and he's, he films, he films me every day, he does. So give him a hand of applause. Yeah, it's really, really good. Thank you very much, Barry. He just goes, yeah, all right. <laughs> carry on. He's going, carry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with people, you know, you can make a, a tremendous businesses, you can. So, Success in business has come in many ways. The success for me started with dyslexia and ADHD. Add goals, focus, determination, and carry on when others give up. I, we'd got friends who was more intelligent than us, got more money, could go and find deals better than us, and they give up. And you've got to have that determination because it's got to be a team of you. So when one person is down, somebody takes the baton. You know, whether they're just exhausted and they can't do that next phone call because it's going to be a bad phone call. Somebody goes, don't worry, I'll do it. You get on with something else. Somebody who, whatever happens, somebody else is there to take it and, and to help them out. And that's what we found. And if you train people, if you, if you are, uh, if you're uh, f fastidious, if you're serious about training people, you know, because I used to say to people, welcome to Kitty Care, when you leave, and they go, I've only been here 10 minutes. I go, yeah, if you leave, or when you leave, because the chances are you will, I want you to take more knowledge with you about the nursery industry as when you've come today. So whether it's tomorrow or next week or 10 years time, you take more knowledge with you when you go. And then I'll have done my job. And if you don't take more knowledge with you than when you go, then I'll have failed. And people go, this is different, this is. This is a different type of environment to what I've worked in before. This guy is going to train us because he's passionate about the customer. He's not, because people go, oh, I'm not telling them anything because they'll only go off and be a competitor. No, they won't because when you give people opportunities, they'll stay with you. And when they know how passionate you are, they will become passionate and they won't go off and, and um, be a competitor, and if they do, we'd, we'd screw them, we would anyway. So, you know, that'd be, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't go. I've never known anybody in all those years to go off and be a competitor, because they don't want that. The 90% of people who want an easy life, they want to know what they're doing, and they want some autonomy on, on making decisions, they do, and they love it. So. So success for us was two heads are better than one, four separate, uh, better than four separate ones. And having our children all working in the same level, going in one direction and motivating 65 staff to understand how the business works. So the key is to motivate and teach everyone to become their very best. So we built this the fifth store we built and we employed 65 people. This was going to be the store to end all stores. And that was the biggest. And Marilyn and I was going to go sailing, on a sh get on a ship and go around the world, which we did, but that was kind of, we're going to leave it, leave it to the kids. And they could, the next year we put, another, that was 65,000 square foot. The next year we put another 20,000 square foot on it. The next year we put another 20,000 square foot on it. And then um, one day, the kids was having a meeting with us, and um, 
they said uh, they saw some plans on my desk and they said what's that dad I said we're building a warehouse or two warehouses for a for a client and we're going around and they go why don't you build us the biggest where the biggest shop in the world two seconds later we was going to make history we was we was going to build the biggest in the world. I just built that there three years ago and extended it and extended it and now we was on just like that to the biggest in the world and why not if you can do it why not so um, the key is never be consistent so I talk about being cons <laughs> I talk about having systems consistent 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 systems I talk about everything being consistent but don't be consistent yourself be ready at a at a click to change direction or get bigger or do what you like so never be consistent in your own mind um, systems are a different thing these were 65 people, uh, the staff, and Marilyn used to look after the staff with a couple of HR people. Um, and the responsibility of management is to provide a safe and secure, I wrote this, a safe and secure job. And that's what I think they did. We created, we wanted to create a stress-free working environment, although it seldom is achieved with the ever-changing competitive world we are in today and I can hear people who work for us saying well that is shit that is you know but actually people don't know what you've got in your heart and your mind they don't know what you how you feel about them and that passion about those people comes out in the um, in the next half it does so um, the key is put people in roles that they are capable of being responsible for and when people are trained and when people have got their own responsibility can make their own decisions and know they're not going to get balled out for doing something wrong um, that's when they become part of the fabric of the business so uh, 2005 was a crazy year and uh, we was offered 36 million from RBS on our two businesses 36 million to do whatever you like with a point 80 over base so like I'm going is that less than one percent okay yeah okay um 20 percent less than one percent yeah okay really so I could have 36 million what would I spend it on prices were too high we did take some we did borrow some rather um and um, but that's how crazy banks were if you had a pulse you'd get a loan if you didn't have a pulse but you got a hole in your ass you'd get a loan you know and that would be that's how crazy those days were but remember if you are borrowing some money remember banks are like they'll give you an umbrella when the sun shines and they'll take it away when it rains and that proved right in 2008-2009 but on the other hand, I'm not saying don't borrow any money because we've borrowed millions and millions we have. Uh, so the key to this is if you wait till all the lights are on green before you go to town, you're never going to get there. So sometimes you need to um, buckle up and borrow some money. So probably the biggest baby shop in the world. So in 30 years, we've gone from a two up two down terrace house selling second hand products knowing nothing about the baby business and this is something that is good because if you don't know the history and you don't know what happened people will say you have to put prams away it's called layaway you put them away on 10 pounds for eight months and then the person comes and and, and buys them and go you're joking because you just fill your shop up with prams and go no I'm not doing that and everybody in the industry said they'll go bust they'll go bust if they don't do it no all the other people who did it went bust you know you've got to keep doing innovating and doing new things so you've got to be on the crest of the wave and you've got to you've got to look for new ways of doing things 
and there was this superstition take the pram home and and if you if you don't have the baby you'll never get your money back we got rid of that superstitious uh, thing completely so um, all of the things she said what do I want and how am I going to get them what how am I going to get that customer to buy that pram today knowing that they're going to keep it for six seven eight months and um, and if they have the if they don't have the baby then uh, they're going to bring it back and we're going to give them the money back you know it's as simple as that so um, we did new things that other people wasn't doing so the key have an overwhelming reason to endure what does that mean endure all the shit that goes on endure the things as well as the good things but the bad things and 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 uh, and I say very often if you're going into business make sure you got a hard hat because you'll be climbing a mountain of red tape and and it'll be falling down on you and um, you be you've got to be strong enough to uh, to get over that so uh, this is right a little bit before the end of this uh, thing how are we doing for time yeah, all right. Five minutes. Yeah, well, that's just right. A little bit of fun, this is. Um, we'd got about, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 70, 80 staff at the time when we went into the new place, 2007. And there was all in black. I'm not going to a funeral, by the way. <laughs> Somebody said, are you going to a funeral? <laughs> when I come in. Good, no, that was last week. Um, and it was all in black, right? And, uh, and somebody, I knew this person who was on the shop floor and says, Nev, where's, where's all your staff? And I go, oh, what do you mean? There is about 10 in this department. They go, there isn't anybody. And there wasn't. Now, we employed lots of boys and girls. And it was a big, big place. There's like about 12 departments. And they'd go and find each other. Because there was all being, f there was friends with each other. And uh, a lot of them got married and had children. That's how friendly they were. <laughs> so there was nobody there to serve the customers. The following day, each department, there was about eight, nine departments, each department, we ordered different colour sweat tops because Barry, who was our security manager, had installed 59 cameras that he could uh, burn CDs on. This is for thieves, right from coming in to going out. Um, and then all of a sudden, Barry could say, oh, the car seat, there's a car seat fitter, you know, is it because he's in, what colour is that, yellow? Orange? Because it's, they'd ring, it, it'd ring, um, uh, the warehouse and it was in blue and say there's an orange in your department and they go well we're sorted out and that stopped overnight so everybody was in their own department because they stuck out like a sore thumb if an orange person was in a blue area or a green person was in a yellow area so time and motion again Every, all the customers got served and then they had to get up to whatever they was getting up to uh, out of in their own time instead of my time I wasn't paying for that <laughs> so yeah so that was that was um, that system again and the system works so you have a problem you make a system to alleviate that problem so um, uh, thank you for listening to part one part two uh, the roller coaster follows uh, after the break so I understand there is a break now and thank you very very much for listening <laughs>